this morning, I will talk about uh, some new trend of uh, missionary opportunities in the world. A word of a mission strategy actually was coined in the middle of the 19th century when the three self concept of the church planting was introduced. So the mission strategies has a history about 150 years. Then after the 1970s, many new challenges were emerged. Lausanne, a movement and uh, your understanding of a people group concept and also Christianity shifting from the north to the southern hemisphere those things are uh, stimulated our understanding of the work of missionaries and method of missionaries so since we got those uh, challenges. New concept of mission strategies were very much developed within the last 30 years. Sometimes we said like this, mission strategies were developed within the last 30 years were much more prevalent than the strategies developed within the previous 120 years. So in a sense, we are living in an age of a period to have a totally different concept of how to do missions, how to do work as a missionaries. Today, I want to just present three typical new trends of missionary opportunities. Please go. Could you turn in the page? All right. First thing is that uh, significant changes has happened in the understanding of the role of missionaries. Traditionally, it was a great honor for missionaries spend their whole life to a certain kind of a ministry only. Lifelong commitment. For example, teaching the Bible in the school, provide the uh, training and equipping program to the convention. They spend their whole life to the limited ministries and died and buried in their country. That was the greatest honor for the missionaries. But today, those kind of understanding of role of missionary was uh, became the old story. It no longer works. Role of missionaries has uh, completely changed. In this day, we believe that missionary is just a part uh, temporary workers. In other words, it's not a good word, but a missionary is a. Uh, dispensable person. We need a non-missionary eternally. Missionary is just needed for a while, temporary. I say that missionary actually is needed when none of the nationals are able to, to carry out certain ministries, or sometimes they have some, but there's a serious lack of resources to carry on those missionaries, missionaries that are needed to fill the gap only until the nations gain their own abilities to carry on that job by themselves. So missionaries are just like the scaffolding. You know the scaffolding. When you build up the, a building, you set the scaffolding to assist the wall. So you set the scaffolding. 
to have the workers easily build up the, uh, construct the buildings. However, once the building was completed, scaffolding should be removed. That's the missionary. So traditionally, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, any mission field has no resources at all. So traditional missionaries had to spend their whole life to the certain ministries, and they wanted to die and bury in their countries. But today, the greatest honor of a missionary is just to complete his task, complete his temporary task, and hands up and leave. That's the greatest honor. So in these days, the role of missionaries uh, recommended to continually change their role depending on the situations. I want to present three steps. The one is a parent role. When missionaries arrived in the mission field for the first time, there's no other option to work as a parent. Parent does mean love and provide their kid everything they need unconditional. So you have to nurture your kid, provide everything without any conditions. But remember that until they can do those things by themselves. You have to feed your babies, but until they can eat by themselves. We have, you have to carry your kids until they can walk by themselves. You have to change their clothes until they can do by themselves. But anyway, in the beginning, you have to do a parent role. You provide everything to the nationals in the field. Then there's one difference from missionaries to the uh, so-called traditional uh, Pastors. For example, if we have uh, 100 members over here, pastors should love all of them equally. If some pastor said, that, well, I love this guy, so I will spend 70% of my time to love them. This part is not much I like them, so I will spend only 20 or 30% of my time to help them. It's a bad pastor, bad minister. However, you know, missionaries are recommended to do so. His goal is to find out national leaders who can carry on those ministries by themselves. So if we find out only five potential national leaders, we recommend the missionaries to spend 80% or 90% of their time to nurture and equip those five potential national leaders and spend a 20 or 10% of your time to the rest of the communities. Our goal is to find out and train and equip the person who can take place of my role, missionary role. Then, as the nationals have grown up, in a certain point of time, you should not any longer to do the parent role. You have to change your role. So the next phase is to partner role. Partner doesn't mean that share the equal authorities, equal partners, equal powers. So maybe you can easily believe that, wow, in the parental role, Missionaries has to do everything by himself. So that was a real burden for him. So in the, as they reach the second role, parent, partner role, maybe they can share their burdens. So he reduced his burden into the half of them. That's not true. It is the most difficult time for the missionaries. So I named it the time of conflict. Let me give you an illustration. For example, one Filipino missionary uh, reached a certain country in Asia. 
and he worked as a parent. Finally, you have a God potential leaders who can work as a part of your ministries. So you recognize him as a partner. You share the same authority, same power to him. So you had a good co-workers. Then, from that time, every moment, you have to experience the conflict and the crash with your national partners. Because the missionaries and the nationals are brought up in a totally different cultures for 30 years or 40 years. Different culture doesn't mean that they had a different decision process process. They have different priority. They have a different way of making relationship. So it is really natural things. They got a conflict in every moment. I will give you an illustration. One day, your mother church in the Philippines sent you the five million pesos as a mission fund. Maybe you will jump and uh, exciting about that. You spend a whole life to think about how can I use these uh, precious monies. And uh, in the morning, you find out you reach the kind of a conclusion. Well, in my church, we have a wonderful kids, boys and girls, but they are so poor, they couldn't get any education. I will decide this fund to educate them, to send those boys and girls to the high school, to send those people to the four years college, to send those people two years uh, Baptist seminaries, and two years later, four years later, seven years later, I wish they became the real key person of my churches. It was so exciting thing. Then suddenly in the morning, his national partner rushed to him, and he said, hey brother, I heard that you received the five million pesos from your churches in the Philippines. Yes, I did. Then he said, okay, let's build up the new building. Missionary's mind is really closed. He didn't want to use that money for the just the church building constructions. So he tried to discuss with him, what about we use this money to educate our young guys? That's a better way. But your national partner never agreed with that. He said like this, look, this, uh, our uh, village over there, they built up the big building, received the fund from the Presbyterian churches. And to see the next village, they built up the bigger buildings, received the fund from the Pentecostal churches. We got to build up the largest building over here with the Baptist money. They began to fight. You know, it is a really difficult result, resolve those kind of conflict. They fight even to the death. Anyway, they overcome those conflicts. Then next conflict come up. Churches are growing. So they reached the time to organize the church. So missionaries prayed a lot and they selected several good resource persons. So this person is very gentle and very uh, mature. So we got, I got to elect him as a deacon. This person is very trustful. I want to ask him to be in charge of our finance. This person is very skillful and a good relationship with the local peoples. I want to place him in the uh, chairman of a building committee. Then he tried to discuss with his national pastors. His first answer is no. He said, why you decided them? I got to decide. Next morning, he brought a list of uh, uh, prospect persons. Then Deacon is his father. Finance Deacon is his wife. Chairman of a building is his younger brother. Missionaries couldn't get it. It's not your uh, family churches. You shouldn't do that. Then the national partner said, no way. It is the natural way we are doing things over here. You got to follow me. They began to fight. 
even until to death. <laughs> okay, let's believe they overcome this conflict. Another conflict comes up. Church is growing more. They need another full-time worker. So missionaries prayed a lot. And he chose one young fine, girl, uh, young, fine boy, very faithful and mature. So he recommended him to be uh, our full-time, one of our full-time workers in the church to the, his national pa- partner. He answered, no. Why? What's the problem? Yes, he agreed that he's faithful, he's mature, he's a nice boy, but it's not in our tribe. Really, missionaries are really upset. Well, what are you talking about? In our church, we have uh, several different uh, tribes uh, gathered together. So you are elected from those uh, these tribes. What about we elect another one from this tribe? He answered, no way. I couldn't walk with another tribe. You know, it's an endless kind of a conflict happened in the field, in the stage of a partner role. What should you do? Kick him out? No way. Be patient. Let me tell you my boy's story. I have one boy. When he was a kid, really, he was a happy boy. Always he was happy. In the morning, he was happy. After the school, he was happy. And then in the time of bed, he was happy. So I was really worried about him. He seems to be a little bit retarded. <laughs> Always happy. Then, as he getting into the middle school, suddenly he changed the hall. He fled always. He always seems to be angry. He wanted to be isolated. As he returned to school, he just closed his door, room door, and the stream is on. Never say politely. How you should do? Kick him out? We know that he come to an age of uh, puberty. You have to wait and trust him. Then, some point of time, he will return to the normal. It's the same way. Spiritually, as you bring up a person to the leader, they had to pass through the age of puberty. So before they begin the puberty period, you have to build up the strong love and trust relationship. And during the difficult times, you got to be patient and trust him and wait him. If not, you cannot get any mature leaders in your walks. It is very difficult times. But you have to pass through successfully. Then, as the national leaders grow no more, you have to move one more step back. As they grow up, missionaries change his role to supporter's role. It didn't go well. Could you turn the page, please? Yes. Supporters' role doesn't mean that nationals taking the leadership positions. Missionaries work under his or her authority. It is very humble things. Well, logically, it is acceptable, but practically, you could not accept it. Suddenly, he points his fingers to you and they begin to commend you. Hey, dear brother missionaries, I will take over that job. You move, remove it from that job, and you take him another job. And several minutes later, he come again. I will take that job too. You move this way, pushing you back to the back room. In such kind of a moment, if you feel happy and uh, appreciate, you are saint. But we know that 
most of missionaries are not saints. So real anger come up in your mind. What an ungrateful person is here. Then you know that it is a natural process of missionary life. You continue to give your response, your authority to the national people's hand, and the gradually you hands off from the ministry as he is able to take care of those jobs. Several years ago, I told this kind of thing to the Southern Baptist Mission working in the East Asia. Then one of the uh, uh, seasoned missionary raised his hand. He asked me very serious questions. Dear brother, if the missionary wanted to take care of everything in the missionaries, what should I do? I answer him that just to do euthanasia. You know the word euthanasia? Most killed. So it is the life of missionaries. So he started to work as a parent and to nurture the nationals and to be a partner, equal authority, equal power, and finally, you have to place him to the leadership position. You work under him, and uh, at the final stage, you hand up, lay down all your work, and you have to leave. Then, what do you have to do in next step? It does not mean the, to terminate your missionary work. After you are recharging again, return to that area and start this cycle again in the needed areas from the parents and nurture them to be a partner and finally let them uh, to be a top leader and you lay down and lead and repeat this cycle again. I know one American missionary serving in Indonesia. He finished this cycle every two years. It's so wonderful. He took one seminary students from the Indonesia Baptist Seminary and started this work again and uh, take him to be a partner and uh, put him into the leaders and he lay off his ministries. And he started again. The life of a missionary does mean to repeat this cycle continually as long as they are needed. So the missionaries need to continue to move and change your role and change your ministry if they need it. Thank you. It's the typical significant changes happen in the mission strategy in these days. Second thing is that today we have a diverse kind of missionaries. It is another new trend. Traditional missionary connoted the four meanings. Number one is that missionary doesn't mean that long-term server. Missionary got to spend their whole life in the mission field. If he or she wanted to spend just a limited time of period service in the field only, it is a lack of commitment. If he's, well, he said, I want to stay here only two years, only one year, three years, it is a lack of commitment. He or well, she got to spend whole, his or her whole life in the mission field. That was the concept of missionary. And the second meaning was that missionary should be reside in that country. If I'm a missionary to China, then I'm not staying in China. It's a ridiculous word. doesn't make sense at all. Missionary must reside in those countries. And third thing, full-time. Missionary is a full-time minister. He has to spend his whole time to do ministries. If someone will get his secular job in the mission field or operating his own businesses and partly he join in the Christian ministry, it is really a lack of commitment. And also, missionary doesn't mean the uh, professional ministers. 
he has to finish the theological education or ministry training or whatever. Those four meanings consist the traditional missionaries. But today, it has changed. We have many short-term missionaries. They want to spend only two or three years in the mission field, no longer. Even we have some non-residential missionaries. I'm a missionary to China, but I'm not living in China. It's possible in these days. And even more, there's a part-time missionaries. <laughs> they are employed in a secular job, or sometimes they operate their own businesses, and partly he joined in the Christian ministry too. And also, more and more, we have more lay persons in the missionary work. So there's are some uh, changes happened. Why do we have this kind of diverse kinds of missionaries in these days? Not because the missionaries' commitment was changing? No. The world has changed. Currently, doors are closing to missionaries. Until the 1945, before the end of World War II, Christian missionaries literally could go and enter any country in the world. But today, time has changed. 1950s, the world was split into two sections, communist world and the democratic world, and the many doors were closed. In this is many nationalism tried to kick them out, the Christian missionaries from their countries. We do not know how many countries in the world, but we believe approximately 270 political identity and unity and state in the world. Among them, 112 closed the door to the Christian missionaries. Then how we should do? The door is closing. Someone said that, okay, 120 countries are closed their door, but still we have 150 countries. So let's go to those countries and serving over there. That's not a wise thing, because the 150 countries opened their door to the Christian missionaries already had their national Christians, national seminaries, national churches. They are not badly needed foreign missionaries. Actually, the Foreign missionaries are badly needed in those 120 closed countries. Then how can you work in those countries? Another idea was that, what about we change the concept of understanding of missionaries? Most of the country closed the door to the traditional missionaries. What about we go into that country not as a status of a traditional missionary, but anyway, witnessing Christ and teach the Bible, work among those peoples. So gradually, we can develop the new kind of a missionary, which was a tradi a traditionally not uh, recognized as a missionary. So in this day, we have a diverse kind of a missionaries. Number two is that Currently, we are living in the age of global migrations. Millions of millions of people are traveling in the world. So many people are residing in foreign countries. Many Filipinos are already living and work in foreign countries. For example, my country is a small one. South Korea has only 50 million populations. You know? One of every six Koreans are living outside of Korea. And the many of them are Christian. If we just extend the concept of missionaries, they can contribute for the kingdom shake. There's no reason we narrow down the concept of missionaries. So we began to extend the concept of missionaries to layperson, to the short-termers, to the uh, tent makers, whatever. 
We are now in this uh, in this kind of a trend. So the you see the different many different kinds of uh, missionaries in these days. And I, I want to briefly explain the, those missionaries. For example, still we have uh, many career missionaries. Career mis- missionaries doesn't mean that they, those who commit their whole life to the missionary work only. Then. Those missionaries always have tr- trouble to get the visa. Hundreds of years ago, missionaries, uh, typical symbol of a missionary is just to wear the helmet and uh, hold the Bible in one hand. In another hand, he has a medical bag and he was uh, chasing by the lions. But in these days, a modern missionary is a symbol, is not, image is not those things. He wears a suit and tie, and in one hand he got an iPad. In another hand, he holds the visa application form, and uh, he was angry at the front of an uh, embassy. That was the image of a modern missionaries. It was really difficult to stay in close countries. Therefore, even among the Korean missionaries, it, uh, we have a diverse kind of uh, missionaries. Number one is residential missionaries. Those are traditional missionaries. Reside in those countries and they educate their kids over there and they have their uh, home and house over there. It is a residential missionary. Today we have many short termers and tent makers and the senior missionaries, whatever. So someone believed that. The importance of this residence missionary should be, should be reduced. No, it is the most effective missionary yet. So, if you can go there as a residential missionary in certain country, do not hesitate to go as a residential missionary. It is most effective. But problem is that those number of countries who receive the residence of missionary is continue to be reduced. Number two is itinerary missionary. They are Korean missionaries, but they are continually to moving. Indonesia is a good country to serve as a missionary. Languages are a little bit simple. They are very much hospitable. And the living cost is really cheap. There's a lot of Christians already. They can help you. And they really are have a good relationship with the foreigners. It's a good country to be, live as a missionary. But there's a devil of visa. So it is really difficult to, to get a missionary visa over there. Malaysia is another good country working as a missionary. But really difficult to, to get a missionary visa over there. India is another good country. More than a billion people are waiting for Christ. Specifically in the northern part of India, there's a really serious lack of missionaries. And uh, there's only a few Christian churches there. But it is imp- almost impossible to get a missionary visa in northern part of India. So the, some missionaries go to the Singapore or Bangkok because they give them a, a, a residence visa easy. They rent their house over there and educate their children over there. And the uh, father missionary began to travel. All those countries provide the three months of t- uh, tourist visas. It is easy to connect, communicate with the nationals living inside those countries. So before you go over there, you communicate through the email and the WhatsApp or whatever, in on a t- uh, telephone, and uh, you arrange everything you have to do. So you receive the three months tourist visa and work concentrated on the jobs in those countries. After three months, he moved to another country from Indonesia to the Malaysia, and uh, he concentrated the th- works he has to do and uh, carry on for three works, three months. Three months later, he moved again to India as a tourist visa and worked extensively and returned home and stayed for three 
months. Of course, they didn't say too much idea. Anyway, she continually traveling. It's uh, sometimes more effective. Spend too much time to get a visa. In China, uh, we have wonderful brothers and sisters already working in China. Then, 1.3 billion people are watching over you. They are ready to report you to the police. So sometimes the missionaries love to stay outside of China, just to traveling into the China. They love to stay in Hong Kong, Chiang Mai, Taiwan, or Seoul. Because it took only one and a half hour from Seoul to Beijing. So they get into the China and work one or two weeks. Mostly they train the people and return to Seoul. Those missionaries who are living in Hong Kong took a train. After two hours later, he's arriving in the Guangzhou. He spent one or two weeks over there and returned home. And later he went back again. Chiang Mai, you took a, take a night train. Next morning, you will be in a Kunming in Yunnan. And he walked two or three weeks and returned home. It, this kind of itinerant missionaries is sometimes more effective. And it, of course, there's another type of a strategic coordinator. Uh, it is a very typical pattern of missionaries. Sometimes we call them a midwife of missionary. <laughs> Just to help those areas to receive the Christ as a whole. He just coordinate them. It took a time. If they take a time to explain this one, I want to move it. We have a many short-termers missionary. Usually short-termer doesn't mean who stay in two or three years. I do not recommend one year because uh, language problem, those who want to stay just only for one year are not effective. That short-termers short -term does mean from the beginning define the period of his service. But recently we have many short-termers in, involved in the missionary war, specifically in America. The real number of increasing missionaries are, comes from the short-termers, not long-termers. Because in these days, uh, the transportation and communication are well developed. So it is uh, possible and effective to serve only two or three years. 150 years ago, when Hudson Taylor traveled from England to China, he took six months. When his second daughter died, he wrote a letter to his mother church. It took six months to deliver from China to his mother church in England. And six months later, his church member received the letter. They were surprised. How can we condolence him? So they wrote the long letters and sent back. It took another six months. One year later, Hudson Taylor already come down then suddenly, a letter from his mother church arrived. What happened? How can you help you? It, is a, it was a missionary work. Actually, the, 30 or 40 years ago, there was no missionary prayer request. We can only pray, God bless missionary. So we call them GD, uh, GBM prayer. God bless missionary. Because uh, when missionary sent his uh, prayer request, it took uh, two or three months later, they received it. Already things have happened. But in these days, email takes less than five minutes to reach any corner of the world. Therefore, we can understand the, what the need of a missionary is. What the situation of missionaries, so we can deploy the short-termers to help them. It is possible. Sometimes it is more effective. And also remember that 
the inclination of a young generation has changed. Two or three generations ago, young generations commit their love without condition. But today, young generation never commit their love without enough information. But it's not bad. In other sense, it means that if you provide more information, they can easily make decide their life. Therefore, we try to give them a some uh, period of their experience as an intern. When you are two years in the field, then they can recognize their calling and they commit their lives. So in this day, we have more short termers. But I strongly recommend you to send short termers to form a team with the long termers. Short termers by themselves could not work effectively. He made too many unnecessary trial errors. So when you deploy the short termers, you let them make a team with the long termers over there. So he joined the ministry and assisted the ministry for two years, three years. That's more effective rather than they work independently. And also we have another one as a tent maker. The word of a tent maker comes from Paul, but Paul was not a tent maker, missionary. Current concept of a tent maker is a combined of those four meanings. Late 1970s, the mission workers in America coined a new kind of a missionary. That was a tent maker. Because uh, multinational companies were emerged at the time from the, in the America, so many young persons could get a job in, outside of the United States. In that chance, uh, mission leaders developed a new kind of a missionary that was tent maker. So tent maker connoted that uh, those who employed already have a job in the foreign country, and he didn't receive the uh, money, uh, missionary fund from their home churches, self provisions, and that most of them are lay person, and they work for limited time, short term, two years, three years. That was tent maker. Then the concept of tent maker continually changed. As they begin to send the tent maker, they realize that if the tent maker worked in the creative assassinations was most effective. So gradually change the concept, tent maker need to go to the creative assassinations. Creative assassination doesn't mean the close the country. Later it changed to the tent maker who are working in the close country as not our status of missionaries. So in these days, uh, usually tent maker does mean the undercover missionaries. It should not. I want you to recommend to understand the tent maker not as undercover missionaries. Go to the mission field, having job and self-supporting, and uh, as a lay person, work for a limited time. It is a very good idea for the Philippines. You already have many overseas Christian workers. Train them. Then, it looks like a very fantastic idea, but practically, it's not a good. Most of the real tent makers are too much busy in the countries. Companies working in other countries demand so many things to their workers because they provide more money for the foreign workers. Actually, you have no time to serving as a ministers. And also, there's a, they do not have a period to learn language over there. And also, many churches do not recognize them as a missionary. Just he got a job in the foreign countries. So they do not provide the prayer support. And so also, 
many cases, foreign workers reside by themselves in isolated sections of the country. There are so many disadvantages, but they can enter the country legal status that's bigger than the, those disadvantages. So think about only four things before you deploy the tent maker. Number one, they have to receive the proper missionary training. Without the missionary training, in a cross-cultural setting, they cannot, never they cannot work effectively. They must receive the proper missionary training. That must be a little bit different from um, training for the career missionaries. But anyway, they have to receive the training. Number two, before you leave, can make a God to learn a language a little bit. Number three, they have to work together with the long-termers who reside in those areas. Can make by themselves cannot penetrate those countries. So always they have to organize a team and work together with the long-termers over there. It is the most effective things. And also we have another one. It's a senior missionary. I define the senior missionaries as those who go to the mission field for the first time over 50 year old. Over 50 year old. 20 years ago, Southern Baptists began to deploy the senior missionaries. They called them Master Program. It's a wonderful name. Then actually they, in the beginning stage, they worried about to deploy the senior citizens to the mission field. They can well order. Could they adjust well in the foreign countries? Could they work properly? Could they become a burden to the young missionaries over there? Then later they found out it is a wonderful potential missionary resources. Because they have a good interpersonal skills, they spend a, a decades in the business job. And also they have a less or no burden of rearing children and uh, financially they are stable. Senior citizen must uh, raise funds by himself. User use his own finances. Because the churches uh, uh, provide the money to the younger missionaries. Therefore, they use their own monies. But someone, those who receive the pension, or some his own uh, personal fund, effectively work over there. And the most of them uh, spend uh, 30 years, 40 years as a deacon in the church, very faithful servant. They are matured. Moreover, they enjoyed their life in the field. It is a good potential. Then, of course, they have weaknesses. But anyway, it is a good chance for you. Then I want to introduce four different kinds of missionary Number one is career missionary. Spend whole life in the missionary world. If God called you to be a missionary, commit your life as a career missionary. If not, you can serve limited period of your life as a short term, two years, three years. I strongly recommend the younger generations. What about spend two or three years in the poor, needed, spiritually hungry countries? It is a most precious experience in your life. I challenge most of my country's young generation. What about you spend at least two years in the mission field? Sometimes, if you can get a job, out of your country, serving as a tent maker. Most effective things. If not, after you retired, 
you can serve as a senior missionaries. In other words, there's no excuse. In any situation, you can serve as a missionary. It's only depend on your prepare, preparations, equipping yourself. If you are properly prepared, if you are properly equipped, there's so many doors are opened and waiting for you. Even I challenge to my fellows that it's no longer our matter to be a missionary or not. Real matter is that how and when I will serve as a missionary. The world is opened, and the Holy Spirit is pouring out. They are waiting someone join in these businesses. Depend on your preparedness and depend on your equipment. God is waiting for you. He want to use you. No excuse at all. Finally, I want to add just one more thing. Oh, there's another one. It's a business as a mission or a business for missions, but I found that in this afternoon in your uh, streamed section, someone talking about a bomb business as missions, I will mention it, but it is one of the good channels. Today, the most mission strategies are concentrating on two words, collaboration and networking. It is a really precious concept. It begins with a book of David Barrett. 1988, David Barrett wrote a very famous book. It is a wonderful book, but it's not readable anyway. His book's title was 700 Plans to Evangelize the World. He said that during the last 2,000 years, there was uh, more than 700 plans to evangelize the world. Still, about uh, 400 or 500 plans are active. Then the, he pointed out many of those uh, world evangelization plans targeted to finish their task by year 2000. He wrote this book in 1980. And he declared that, I'm sure, all of them will be failed. Then he mentioned very important things. The global church already have, has enough capacity to evangelize the world. It's not because their ability is left. The global church already has enough facility and the capacity to evangelize the world, human resources, financial resources, and the experienced resources, whatever. Rural church has enough capacity, but because of two reasons, he believed they, will, they are all fair. Number one is that concentration of divine resources. Christian churches has great resources, but it was too much concentrated in certain countries. America, Europe, Korea. So it is our burden to spread even the divine God's resources to the world. We can achieve the global evangelization. However, it is a big stumbling stone Second point is that ugly competitions among Christians. I'm Baptist, so I have to work and plant the Baptist churches. They are Presbyterian, so they are doing their own businesses. Pentecostal churches got to doing their own business. I'm an independent mission agency, so I'm doing my own job. It is ugly competitions. It's not a rival businesses. But so far, there was a serious ugly competitions among Christian agencies. So he pointed out concentration of resources and the ugly competitions. Because of those two factors, all global evangelization plan will be failed. 
Since that time, mission strategies dramatically began to change it. How can we overcome those two serious defections? So they began to change the direction. How can we work together? How can we build up the network? So in the 21st century, two words are really key words of this age, collaboration and networking. Collaboration does mean work together, work together. Networking doesn't mean share the God's resources together. Those who achieve these two things more, collaboration and the networking, will achieve better results in this period of time. So I was, I was in charge of a missionary training in Korean Baptist Church for 10 years. In the training, I told our missionary in the training, you may work together with a Presbyterian missionary in the field. You can, you are able, you are allowed to plant a church with other denominational missionaries. You can work together with some Methodist missionaries. They asked me, how can we name the church? Baptarian, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, Baptist, uh, Pentecostal, whatever. I told them, denomination is a necessary evil. We need to build a plenty the church of God. So I strongly recommend them work together any evangelical Christians, unless they are not heretical groups. So many our missionaries are working together, navigator missionaries, CCC missionaries, sometimes they have a strong relationship with the other denominational missionaries. We got to do collaboration, work together. And also we build up the networking, sharing the God's resources together. Mission agencies build their own missionary houses set independently. Sometimes they develop their databases by themselves. What a foolish thing. Our resources are not ours. Only God given to us. So we can share whatever we have with any other Christians. So in Middle East, we have a center building. Then I recommend our missionaries, share that building with any missionaries. If we have a church building, for example, we have a church building, and you have only worship service on Sunday morning. Your congregation only use that building. In Africa, usually they have only one building. Many different churches use that building together. So Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, Baptist Church worship over there, and 9 o'clock, Methodist Church worship over there, 11 o'clock, Presbyterian Church worship over there, 12 o'clock, another group come over there and worship there. What a beautiful thing. Why do we have to separate buildings? Why do we have to have a separate institution? Why do we have to separate programs, trainings, networking? So as you practically begin the effective missionary work from now on, these two words have to be in your mind. collaboration and network. How can we work together other fellow Christians? How can we share our network, our resources with other Christian believers? All are not ours. Everything is God's one. I want to tell you the very typical example. 1990, Thomas Wong he was a Chinese-American. 
started a new movement, so-called the 82,000 movement. He was challenged from the idea of David Burrett. He tried to get rid of the problem in the mission strategies, concentration and uh, competitions. So in the 82,000 movement was a one of a global movement, Christian movement. They do not have their own strategies. Every two or three other years, they pro held the GCOE, Global Consultation, World Evangelization. They only prepare the place, the p agents together, together, discuss to how can we work together, how can we make a build, net building network together. That's only the work of a GCOE and the 82,000. They had uh, 19 different tracks, for example, evangelism and the prayer track and the church printing track, whatever. Then in the track, all the mission agencies and denominations gather together and they discuss how can we work together. Southern Baptist Church was uh, one of the strong supporters of uh, and 82,000 movement. For example, I'm not sure they uh, revealed it or not. IMB provided lots of uh, big money to the weekly Bible translator. Because they believe they need an independently translate the Bible because the weekly is a better institution, they have a better skills, better experience, better experts. So instead, of Southern Baptist jump into the new ministry of Bible translation, they just support the fund, great fund to the weekly Bible translator. For the campus ministries, some campus ministry agencies are more effective. In that case, we just invest the money to them rather than we compete them with them. It was most effective things. So, in these days, uh, any good, any effective mission strategies does heading towards these two concepts. How can you work together, collaboration? How can we build up the networkings? So, it is one of good example that you build the Federation of Southern Baptist Convention in Philippine Incorporation, 2011 and uh, you establish one sending body. It is a good example of a collaboration and networking. In the field, they need to work together with uh, their own national conventions. So anyway, I want to close my lecture to emphasize this two words, collaboration and networking. Once you achieve these two things, we will, you will succeed in the missionary world in this time of period. Thank you very much.